Okay, sorry about that. Um, so good evening from Scotland. Um, in my talk, I want to explore a potential contribution that cognitive science could make uh, to the improvement of mental health services. Um, so I think it is widely acknowledged now that uh, there is a crisis, uh, a mental health crisis, and with it comes an increased demand for uh, the evaluation of mental health services. Now, traditionally, uh, to understand uh, the efficacy of, say, counseling and therapy, uh, people have been manually coding recordings and then perform some sort of um, mainly qualitative analysis. And more recently, natural language processing um, methods are, are trying to fill that gap. But both of these methods run into privacy issues because very often, clients are reluctant uh, to consent to have their data analyzed, uh, even though, or maybe especially if they're told that their data are being analyzed by an AI. So the aim of that project that I want to report on, and I should say it's an entirely exploratory project, is to see whether we can use nonverbal speech parameters, for example, speech rhythm, uh, to gain some information about the efficacy of therapy sessions. So I'd like to think of these parameters a little bit like footprints in the sand, uh, which give us some information uh, about the person, the size, the weight, what direction uh, they were going. And uh, in a similar way, I think that uh, nonverbal parameters of uh, speech can also give us information about certain communicative strategies in the counseling session and how it affects therapy efficacy. And the reason I think this is a valuable, a viable approach is because we can think of communication as a dynamic system where uh, emergent patterns of uh, structural organization are measurable on multiple timescales. And there is now uh, a sizable literature emerging that shows that uh, alignment uh, and coordination in communication are linked to communicative success and that alignment or this coordination can be measured on different levels like the lexical level, the syntactic level, the prosodic level, um, but also body movement, gestures, gaze, and even physiological parameters like heart rate. So in this study, we will focus on speech rhythm. Um, now we uh, we're lucky enough to get access to a counseling corpus, which was a set of recordings from a community counseling project conducted between the years of 2015-2018. This was a corpus done um, um, in the context of uh, counselor training within a pluralistic therapy framework. Overall, there were 17 therapists uh, counseling 45 clients. But as you can see here on the left, this little chart tries to show the distribution of counseling sessions per clients, per therapist. So the coding on the, of the therapists is on the left, it's color coded. And you can see that uh, therapists had different numbers of clients and clients attended for different numbers of sessions. So we selected what we thought was a roughly uniform amount of sessions per clients, also taking uh, into account the audibility of the audio recordings. So we ended up with a corpus comprising 12 therapists and 30 clients. And the mean duration of the sessions was 50 minutes, ranging from seven to 89 minutes. And from these uh, sessions, we extracted time series of intervals between amplitude peaks. So you can think of them as intersyllable intervals, uh, which are indicative both of speech rate, but also of pauses and patterns of uh, intervals of silence in the session for the joint speech stream of the therapist and um, the client. Now, the value of this corpus arises from the fact that we also have a range of auxiliary measures. So we have measures about the mental state of the clients. And particularly, we had measures of depression and distress. So for depression, um, they use the patient health uh, questionnaire, the PHQ-9, and for the stress, the core, the clinical outcomes of routine evaluation and routine evaluation questionnaire. 
And as you can see on the top right here, they are extremely tightly correlated. So for everything that I'll be reporting on today, I'm just gonna use the scores uh, from the core, the distress scores. And most um, beneficially for our project, after each session, both the therapist and the client provided uh, ratings of the efficacy or the quality of the session on a number of scales, helpfulness, merit and productivity of the session. Now, these uh, ratings were administered before we got involved with this project. So the different rating scales are not ideal from a psychometric point of view. So we rescaled them and then uh, um, obtained a composite quality measure uh, or a composite measure of the ratings from the therapists and the clients of session quality and, and uh, session outcome. So let me show you first some general results of some aggregate parameters. So you can see on the top here uh, that uh, the higher the distress score of the client, the um, lower the amount of talk. So there is a negative correlation and that makes perfect sense and is in line with the literature suggesting that depressed people just tend to talk less. And on the bottom, you can see how the distress scores on the left are linked to the session quality ratings. So the client ratings in blue, the therapist's rating in uh, red, and you can see immediately that clients tend to rate the sessions higher than the therapists. There may be a number of reasons for that, that the clients have sort of um, different expectations or perhaps that they are just being polite and uh, don't want to give the therapist negative ratings. But in any case, again, we can see that the client mental states affects how the quality of the session is rated. The more the stress the clients are, um, the lower the rating of the session. And on the right, you can see that the more talking there was in this session, and talking was measured simply as the session duration minus all the periods of silence. Uh, there more, the more talking there was in the session, the higher the quality of the session was rated. But what we were interested in is whether uh, the patterns, the, the dynamic patterns in uh, speech rhythm give us some more information about session uh, efficacy or session quality over and above these aggregate measures. And so in order to quantify these dynamic uh, patterns, we used recurrence quantification analysis, which is a method for uh, visualizing and quantifying patterns in which a complex system revisits its own earlier states. So um, a classic example of this is the Lorentz attractor. And you can see here, if you look at the trajectory in this three-dimensional system, if you compare the orange and the black points, this would be a point of recurrence where the system sort of revisits an earlier state. And then in the middle, uh, what you're seeing is a recurrence plot where you basically have time on both axes and we can plot for each point in time on which an event happens, on which other time points this event also recurs. And most importantly, we can, uh, when we have time series data, we can try to recreate the state space of the complex system from a projection of the time series onto one single dimension using uh, the method of time delayed embedding. So we were interested in using recurrence quantification to see whether we can get more information about session quality from the dynamic um, patterns of communication. So from recurrence plots, one can obtain a number of recurrence parameters. And I don't want to uh, go into the details of these parameters, just to say at this point that these parameters are indicative of the length and complexity of recurring patterns, but also the bottom two parameters, laminarity and trapping time of how much a system gets stuck in a specific state. So you can think of it sort of as a measure of repetitiveness. And uh, we wanted to see whether these parameters provide additional information over and above, say, for example, the amount of talk that I showed you earlier. So, as I already alluded to, we used auto um, recurrence quantification analysis, which means uh, we treat 
the speech stream from the client and the therapist as one single time series. And we did this both for pragmatic and for theoretical reasons. The pragmatic reason was that it was extremely difficult to diarize these recordings, but also theoretically, it makes sense to treat uh, these conversations as a synergist or these diets as a synergistic unit, because in conversation, people not so much mirror what the other person does, does but try to complement the other person's communication patterns and this is what we think auto recurrence captures in this instance so we use the r package provided by coco and dale and we used a delay of one and an embedding dimension of 10 and crucially because session lengths differed uh, we um, adjusted the radius for each session to uh, obtain a recurrence rate of two percent to make uh, the um, recurrence plots between sessions comparable. So let me show you what these recurrence plots look like. So here you see on the left, the left two recurrence plots are uh, from sessions with low distress scores. And on the right, the two recurrence plots are from sessions with high distress scores. And you can see immediately what I um, mentioned earlier, uh, the greater brightness of the sessions on the right indicates it's simply a smaller amount of talking, which is associated with higher distress. But also the top two sessions are uh, sessions ranked uh, of higher quality and the bottom ones of lower quality. And I think the crucial thing to take away from these is that the qualitative patterns of recurrence differ considerably. So is this variability informative of session quality? In order to find out, we used mixed effect modeling with um, random effects of sessions nested within clients, nested within therapists, controlling for client distress and the amount of talk. So if we first look at how therapist, the therapists assess the, the session quality as our outcome variable, what we see here is that therapist ratings are more affected by the amount of talk and the speech rhythm dynamics, the recurrence parameters, play a subordinate role. Perhaps I uh, should add at this point that because the recurrence parameters in our particular corpus were highly correlated, we ran separate models with each recurrence parameter entered separately as a predictor over and above uh, distress and amount of talk. So we can see there is a little bit of a link between laminarity and trapping time, which are parameters for how much the system is stuck in a specific state, which are negatively linked to a uh, session quality. Now on the right, we have the client's rating of the session. And here we can uh, see that the client's ratings are much more affected by the speech rhythm dynamics, by the recurrence parameters, and not by the amount of talk. It's interesting because this is actually in line with one earlier study, Reusel et al. for 2013, did something similar looking at uh, or evaluating quality of interactions of support workers with learning disabled clients. And they also found that the support workers um, ratings of the quality of these interactions were better predicted by aggregate parameters, whereas the clients themselves were more in tune with the actual dynamics of the session. But crucially, what we find is that there is a negative link between recurrence parameters and session quality ratings. And that is actually at odds with um, what has been found in the literature where people have mainly studied um, cooperative interaction in joint action contexts. And there you see a positive relationship between um, recurrence parameters and communicative success. Here we see the opposite. And that presumably has something to do with the fact that the communicative goal of therapy is probably different than the communicative goal of a joint action task. Because the goal of therapy uh, is for the client to be challenged in their ways of uh, thinking and acting and for entrenched patterns to be interrupted. So to sum this up, I think this exploratory study 
um, is encouraging in the way and that it suggests that using nonverbal parameters may provide a fruitful avenue towards automated assessments of client states and therapy outcomes. And that it may be um, useful to analyze not just aggregate parameters, like for example, um, the mean intersyllable intervals or um, the standard deviation, but also these dynamic patterns of communication using recurrence quantification analysis. And uh, most interestingly, we obtained this negative link between recurrence patterns and session quality, which may reflect the different goals of therapy compared to other communicative contexts. So a desire for variation in content and communication strategies, and also um, an attempt to modify entrenched patterns of thinking and um, behavior. So uh, aside from sort of the, the applied um, motivation of the study, I think there's an interesting theoretical uh, message here, namely that the link between the dynamic measures of coordination and the attainment of communicative goals depends on the type of communication. Now, this being a highly exploratory study, as I said, there are lots of caveats, which I'll just flash up here, and maybe we can come back to some of them in the discussion. And I would just like to end by uh, with a shout out to my partners in crime, and thank you very much for listening.